Hello, everybody. online 
stone a mask out of Israel, and they are 97% effective against COVID, and like the best in 95 is 95% effective, so slightly better, but they're really breathable, really breathable, and my friends gave me a bunch of them. Aww. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> you should get paid for that because you're very good. Yeah. Yeah. So I wear those all the time. Tag them on social. That's how that works. Do you swim in it? I'm old. I don't know about social. <laughs>
Um, they were looking for someone to play Spike for, uh, I think I was told, like three months. They were looking for someone, and they just couldn't find anybody that fit, that, I guess. And they must have said, scrape the bottom of the barrel. I'm serious, because I had just, I had just gotten in town. I, I didn't have a lot of television credits. I had a massive amount of theater credits, but they don't care about that. Um, in fact, it's not, because like theater actors, we tend to be a little too big for camera. So. Um, I just had a couple of couple of things on my resume, uh, and they called me in, and I, I don't know, man. I think I did the accent right. I think I think Juliet Landau liked me because she came from theater too, so she was at the audition, and I was basically Spike was just her boy toy originally, so it was all about who does Juliet kind of connect with, and we connected about theater, um, and the audition was really well, and. When I got cast, it was only three days before we started filming. So they they go um, they, they they sprayed my, my hair black to see if that looks good because um, they wanted like the Sid Vicious of the Vampire set. I told them you don't want Sid. And they're like, yeah, we do. I'm like, I'm gonna give you Sid so you know you don't want it. This is, this is Sid Vicious. Girls like me because I've got a beautiful face. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sid was an idiot, man. He, like, he didn't play on the album, he ruined the tour, he broke up the band. <laughs> he wanted to rock. Right? Yeah. 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 Like, whatever. Yeah. So they, they, they spray painted black and it didn't look good. And I remember that the hair department was like, sorry. It's only like two colors for punk. It's only bone white and jet black. Everything else is glam, so you're gonna have to bleach you. But we only have three days, or two days at that point, so we're gonna bleach you today, and then we're gonna bleach you tomorrow, which you're really not supposed to do, because it hurts so bad. It was horrible. It was just in the corner shape. But I was so poor. <laughs> So there's this thing, this thing called the breakdown services that basically the casting director will put out, we're looking for this kind of character, and there'll be like a little paragraph about them. And they were like, Tara, she's like a little sylph, uh, woodland sprite character. I was like, I'm as far from this like, little woodland sprite as you can get. Um, so I was like, well, I'm not going to get this. And I went in and read, and it went well. And uh, then I get this call. I, I, I had gone into the audition, and then I, I was supposed to go visit my dad, who lived like four hours away. And so I got in the car, and I went up to see my dad, and I get this call, hey, can you come back? I want to see you. And I'm like, no. <laughs> four hours away. It's not going to happen. So like, well, they're going to they're gonna see some more people today, and if they don't find this person today, then it'll be a weekend, and come back on Monday. So they didn't find anybody. I went back on Monday. And it was just supposed to be like a couple episodes, maybe one, two. And it snowballed and became th three seasons and, and, and a big chunk of my life. And now it's you rocked. <laughs> Probably like the most. 
just like, let's do this, this is so much fun. And then of course, how many, how many days later, right? Like every day you come in after, so we do, we usually, I was telling some of this earlier, we usually do an episode in like what, eight days? Yep. This thing would not die. We did our first eight days, and then we were working on other episodes, and I'd walk into the trailer, and the dress would be hanging there. Yeah. Like, I guess we're doing more musical. <laughs> we, like, that was, like, illegal. Yeah. Like, that was, like, if SAG, if our yeah. union had found out about that, it was super trouble. illegal. It was yeah. so good. <laughs> Don't tell your agent about it. Okay. <laughs> Just put the course, it puts the course in, in the... <laughs> Getting to direct this. She is the best director. 
I gave him money. <laughs> I swear to God, because she, she wrote and produced and directed a film called Chance, and I thought I was doing you a favor because you I were. used to produce theater. <laughs> you were. Like, but no, because I think I got one of my best performances out of that film.
and they didn't give Mark any lead time. So it's this hard is, to get this shirt over your head. It's all about basically starving yourself to death, really. Oh my God. But so I it's just as bad for for many of the store women in our industry, sadly. Thank you. Yeah. It is. But I, I I went to them and I was like, okay, if you want to belugas me, if you want to. <laughs> It was the end of the season. If you want me to serve up, can you give me some warning, please? I'll give you what you want, but I need a little time. And and, and they said, oh, well, I'm glad you asked, because uh, get ready. Uh, you're going to fall in love with Buffy next year. And I was like, that's great. I've been thinking the same thing. <laughs> Look, it's not about 
you guys being able to cancel is about the fact that you are two, two female identifying people who are in a relationship, who are good to each other. You go into people's houses every week, they get to know you, and all of a sudden, people who have never met someone who is gay, they, they know you, and, and it changes them. And they're just, oh, I like gay people, I love Tara and Willow. And it just, it changes people's perspective. It opens minds. Television, you sell detergent on television. You can sell treating people with respect. You know? Come on. And so after that, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, really powerful and important to me. It changed my mind about him. I, I learned from, from him talking to me. And it was such a beautiful relationship, too. We raised on, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to take this time to take questions from the audience. You'll see two microphones, one on either side. Please line up if you have any questions. And you guys can ask me anything that you want. <laughs> if you want to try to embarrass me, I'm, I'm ashamed. Uh, I don't promise to answer anything you ask. <laughs> 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 uh, you know, but uh, it's, 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 it's everything's cool. It's all good. bunch of like things where you're on fire oh, and stuff like that. Hold on. Oh, sorry. There you go. Give it a second. I'm going to turn you on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there, you go. there you go. I think it's good. Uh, sorry. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't know the mic was on. Uh, when yeah. you were Spike, you got to do a lot of stuff where you got cameras on fire and Spike was in the sun. How do you feel about uh, having stunts done? Is it like scary or? I love stunts, um, and good question. Um, uh, I came, I came from theater where you don't get a stunt man. <laughs> so when I, when, when I first said, oh, "You're just gonna like do a couple moves, James, and then we'll have Steve take care of the rest, and you won't get hurt. Don't worry." I was like, "Oh, come on." <laughs> uh, I remember Steve Tartaglia was stunt spike, and he he came from Hong Kong, where he was the preeminent Caucasian actor slash stunt performer. And he did stuff over there that made me nauseous when I saw him. <laughs> he was willing to do stuff, because they don't have like any safety regulations in Hong Kong. So he was willing to do stuff that other stuntmen were never willing to do. I was able to do stuff that maybe some other actors weren't comfortable doing, and we got some good stuff. Um, but he came up to me one time, and he's like, James, uh, the stunt crew were, were really impressed that you like to do so many of your own stunts, really. Very impressive, but if I get on camera one shot an episode, my pay doubles. Just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> so after that, I, we can sit down with the script and be like, "That's when I get. Uh, that's when I get a boo boo." I twist my ankle doing that. To make it to become a but uh, that said, there's a lot of stuff that you see on the show that I could, you know, uh, that that Steve did. Um, the fire gang, though, I think there was just one where they actually lit me on fire. Um, season three, uh, and he's, you know, Spike calls it, uh, all of a sudden, I wanted that gag. And they said no. They said, James, that is the most dangerous gag in all of Hollywood. It's an unprotected burn gag. Which, which is like, normally when you see a person burn, you're, it's the clothes that are burning. But this was actually a hand on fire with no clothes, no glove or anything. And, like, to do that, if you just dip your hand in the fuel, and it's goopy fuel, and then you dip your hand in a protective gel, and then they light you on fire. And they told me, <laughs> they, said, they said that you have 30 seconds, there's a little waterfall on the set, you have 30 seconds to wake up, do your acting, whatever you want to do, and get to that waterfall in 30 seconds, and if you, if you, if you take any longer, you're not good. And I was like, alrighty oh. But <laughs> the reason I wanted the gag was I thought it would be hilarious. I wanted a close-up of my face asleep, waking up and seeing the fire. And he's asleep and he's hung over, so it should take him a while to realize that this is reality. Like, oh that's pretty. 
the only good Dragon Ball movie ever made. And, and I get down to the desert, and it's all a lie. It's only 30 million. Stephen Chow has nothing to do with it, and it's just obviously going to be a bad film. And I'm just like, I was a cop. <laughs> They're not even using any stuntman for, for this movie, and so I'm getting beat and pummeled every day, and I'm like, I, God, I was just sipping coffee right in a car. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, slash 
lessons and a lot of, you know, pressure of musical <laughs> episode that's like kind of outside of what normal acting is. So I was just wondering like what were your overall experiences with that? Yeah. You wanna start? Sure. Um, no, so it was uh, you know, it's a little terrifying when you, you get a song and you're like, that's not my range. Um, <laughs> I, I like to sing in my chest voice. I'm sort of a mezzo soprano. I'm not. I'm not like a like. I don't sing super high normally. Um, and so I listened to the song. I was like, Oh my God, it's so high! Um, so I was a little intimidated by it, frankly. But I grew up like like James. We, we both grew up doing theater, and I think um, you kind of have to do everything as a as a theater actor. You have to be able to move, dance, sing, act. Um, so I grew up doing all of that stuff in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, and the, the Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, yeah, none of, I mean, neither of us, I didn't know anybody. I didn't get a leg up in this industry. Like, I came from Alabama, so it's sort of amazing that the two of us are sitting here and kind of, I basically, I think it says anybody, if you have the perseverance and the talent and you're willing to just, like, put the work in, you can get here. Which is kind of amazing, right? Um, but yeah, so I grew up doing musical theater. I was in, I, I sang in the Orlando Opera when I was there when I was a kid, like singing sing the kids' section of a little stuff in Papua and, you know. Um, it, yeah, so I grew up doing it. I love singing. I love singing in the shower the most. <laughs> it sounds really good and no one can hear me. Um, <laughs> So yeah, so they, they had um, they had a, a coach that you know they're like if you want to come in and work with her a little bit you, you know so I went and you know did some exercise you know like vocal exercises and just she played piano and I sang through the song a bunch and that was actually very helpful because I was like oh I can I can do the higher range I just have to like relax it's fine you're gonna be okay um, but yeah it was it was a little intimidating but it was also really fun and then you knew when you got on set be lip syncing to yourself. So it's not like you had to perform it for everybody. Um, and I was explaining to, was it, was it to, to you, Xander? In your, yeah, I was explaining to them that like, you, you don't do a lot of live singing on film and television because there's like the drift that happens between the video and the audio. Because those, they're, they're separate things and they're, they're sunk together. And for some reason, the music starts to drift and so it gets out of sync. If you let it, you know, if you have like a long extended shot, like by the end of the shot, it'll be the singer like, and then la 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 la. So, uh, so that's why all the lip syncing and stuff. So it was very like relaxing to know that you just had to lip sync to it. You didn't have to perform it in front of everybody 50 times. So now that I've babbled on at you, I'll let James. <laughs> I, yeah, I did uh, musical theater. Um, I, I'm doing that stuff. And uh, there was only one community theater in town, and they all that they did was musicals. Um, and so I was down to do that. Uh, but I was horrible at singing and dancing. Like, I was playing in bars uh, when I was 13. Um, I would only play James Taylor songs. Like, I refused. No one is as good as James Taylor. I'm not going to take that Steve. No. <laughs> <laughs> but the musical theater style of singing, oh, Oklahoma, you know, like, couldn't do it. Um, maybe didn't want to. I don't know. Yeah. You uh, could totally do it. It's a matter of if you want to. Yeah, yeah. Or experience, I guess. Yeah. And, but I was a horrible dancer. Like, I remember <laughs> they put me in the, the dance chorus of Guys and Dolls, and I just couldn't <laughs> memorize the dance moves. I just couldn't. They didn't stick in my... So they put me in the back, you know, like three rows of dancers, I put one in the back so that I could watch everybody else, and I still didn't do it. So like, after that I became the, the actor, they would cast me in the role that didn't have any singing or dancing in the musical that's supposed to be all singing and dancing. I did, I did stuff there. Um, and so, you know. an actor who can move. Yeah, it's weird, like, stunt choreography, I pick up like that, you know, like, and it's basically the same thing. It is. You know, so I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think I lucked out with the musical because I didn't really dance, and and the song was a rock song, you know. Like I didn't really know how I wanted to approach the song, 
So I, I, um, I learned on guitar. I've seen that video. What's that? I saw a video. I saw a little clip of you playing. That's why I, I that's oh, why I yeah. realized. Like, okay. Yeah, because I, 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 I could figure out how to make the chords fit. I've got to change the key and everything, but if you, if you do it in a certain way, it starts to sound like Nirvana. Or yeah. yeah. It, it, and I, I remember playing it for Joss. I was like, Joss, I figured out how to do the song. Check this out. And I, and I play it. It's like, that's great if Nirvana was doing it. I'm like, <laughs> exactly! It's like, it ain't Nirvana, kid. It's like a Broadway rock song. It's completely different. Um, but yeah, so I, it, it kind of played to the things that I could do. And I frankly didn't have to stretch like a lot of the other people in the cast who were like way outside the comfort zone. Um, I think Sarah asked if she could juggle live chainsaws rather than have to sing. <laughs> <laughs> that would be safer for my career, please. Yeah. You know? uh, but the fact that, they, that they, as a company we didn't give up, and, and we, even though we, we knew we were going to fail, we were certain we were going to fail, and all our careers were going to be over, we decided that we were going to go down swinging. Um, and we didn't give up. And, and it worked. Welcome to the fire. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Take a question from over here. I'm sorry, can you like kiss the mic like you're a rock star? <laughs> okay. A few minutes ago, you said that you wish that Buffy and Spike's relationship was more one sided. I was wondering what your feelings were about the I love you, no you don't, goodbye between them in the finale. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, I, that's my favorite line, actually. Um, because to me, what he is saying, no you don't, but thanks for saying it, is he's saying, you can't love me, because actually I am beneath you. What you, you. You might be attracted to me, and you might actually feel sorry for me, you might have warm feelings for me, but you're a hero. You, you can't love what I really am, because he's gotten a soul, and he's honestly looking at what he's done. And that's where I thought, look, he, he's actually self-aware now, you know? And now there's hope that he's going to be able to redeem himself. Uh, and he's going to have to go, and I, my thinking was that he's going to go away from Sunnydale, and he's going to grow up, basically. He's going to figure out what to do with the soul of his. And as soon as he thinks that he deserves her, he's coming back to Sunnydale, and they're going to get married. <laughs> and it's all happily ever after time after that. And, and so, I, but, I, but I thought that, that was the beginning of hope. I'll take one from over there. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, what was it like to shoot the end of season five not knowing whether you were getting picked up and then getting picked up by UPN and all of that? We pretty much assumed we were getting picked up. Yeah. Did you hear that we, we might not? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. We were all arrogant. Ah. Oh, 
Oh, so, that sucks. Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually working with DC uh, on a, 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 write, a writing and an illustration team came to me and wanted me to come up, come aboard for, for a pitch. So it hasn't been, we haven't pitched it yet, but we're working on the pitch. So hopefully, I think it's good, actually. Um, yeah, I can't really help but say anything. You didn't hear anything. Silence. Code of silence in the theater. <laughs>
25 years, like you know, 20 years later. And I, I don't really understand that, but like the thought, the thought that, that goes, you, we just need to think about these things. There are ways to, to address these things and be, to make great television and dramatic television and emotional television without um, pummeling uh, an underrepresented community and abusing them, <laughs> you know? Um, I don't, I don't know how we change it other than be the change ourselves, make the stuff we want to see, encourage and support other queer content creators, you know, um, choose, choose to be part of things that are, you know, positive, and, that, and that's not saying you can't have a queer character who, who is multi-layered and goes through awful emotional things, they're just, you have to be thoughtful about it, that's all, just be thoughtful. So I think if there had been, if there had been, I think if there had been more of like a, a Queer, like, queer representation in, in the writer's room. I mean, Drew Greenberg was kind of it. And I think if there had been more, maybe, maybe, to, and I don't even know if he was on the show at that point, and I can't remember if he had left by then or not. Um, uh, but maybe if there had been, if there had been more diversity in the writer's room, maybe somebody would have said, hey, let's do it a different way. <laughs> that, that's my representation. You're talking about me in my life. And I think that, that also is why we need more diversity behind the scenes and in the creative side of, of, of film and television and also in the executive track and the development track, studio, like just need more diversity. More, more unique voices who can, can kind of go, hey, let's not do it that way. And we all, as like white entitled people like myself, need to be like, okay, I'm listening. I messed up. I did it wrong. How do I do it right? And it's not to put the emotional labor on people who are, who, are, who are not me, but it's to just say, I'm listening, and I'm fallible, and I mess up, but let's work together as a group to make this, this, this community and this world better. Because we can, we can do that. We're, there, there's so many cool people out there, you know, we can make good stuff. So, I'm gonna get off my soapbox now. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking us. You guys are awesome. And thank you for